uh, coming out tonight. Uh, we appreciate the uh, support. And uh, one thing I think uh, we are absolutely blessed with is, uh, did y'all hear some of that worship music going on tonight? I mean, absolutely perfect. I mean, if we would just focus on, on, st on stuff of that nature, that is one thing that would make a big difference. And that's what I'm talking about tonight is let's make a difference. You know, everybody hopes that they'd make a difference. I mean, y'all want to make a difference, right? Well, you know, I see difference makers right here among us all the time. I, I'm lucky enough that I, I'm able to come in here early on, on Sundays and I get to see, you know, the worship team preparing uh, things and Julie and Steve and Joel getting ready for stuff just to make it easier for y'all to worship, you know, and that makes a difference. And it's stuff like that is, you know, you don't have to be the guy standing up here talking. You don't have to. I mean, there's plenty of behind-the-scenes things that make a difference. And uh, one of the ones we're going to talk about tonight is prayer. Because, uh, you know, most of us would say that prayer is necessary. You know, but not necessarily our prayers. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's hard enough for most of us to make an honest request of a friend. But when you label that as a prayer and your friend is termed God, you know, then it gets all weird. I mean, because most of us, you know, feel like, oh, you know, I really don't know how to pray or I don't pray real good. Well, let's start by uh, praying. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this night. We thank you for any time that you give us and that we take advantage of worshiping you and hearing your word. We thank you so much for the rain from this week to nourish Mother Earth, and we thank you for the sun that comes right after it to make everything continue to grow. We thank you for everyone that showed up tonight, and please watch over them as they leave and drive home today. We thank you so much for all that you bless us with. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So let's flip over to Luke 11.1. 1. And it said, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name, know who you're praying to you know it's 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 not a casual thing this is your creator that you're asking and requesting from uh you could do a whole sermon on just this little uh chapter here or part of a chapter here but we're just going to hit a couple points here uh your kingdom come give us each day our daily bread and now this one, because I did some research on this one, is in Greek, that actually means give me tomorrow's bread today. Give me an abundance so I don't have to worry about tomorrow's bread. It's, you've already handled it, which we know he does that. You know, he gives us all of our needs, and, and that's the things we should pray for. We shouldn't just pray for when we're sick or we, you know, have a, a you know lost our job or something of that nature. You know we should ask, give me what I need today to live. I mean this is this is what he wants us to do. So if you don't if you don't think you pray well, read this chapter and it teach Jesus will teach you how to pray. But on you know some of us go. You know, I do pray, but you know it's it's not really doing a whole lot well i mean if you're praying without confidence it's not going to do anything turn back to hebrews 4 15 16. it says for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin 
Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So if you ask, ask with confidence, knowing that he's going to provide. Now, some of us might think, well, you know, one single prayer of mine won't make a difference. You know, let's be honest. You know, God's God. He's going to do what he's going to do. You know, he, he doesn't need my input. Well, you know, there's a, uh, a well-known business axiom that uh, states, if you want to know something, ask an expert. So as Christians, let's ask Jesus if he thinks prayer was important. In Luke 5, 15, 16, flip back there with me. Sorry that took so long. <laughs> Yet the news about him spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So, I mean, he could have stayed, gathered more people to teach, more people to heal, but he thought it was important enough to go and pray. And up a page in Luke 6, 12 and 13, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called disciple, disciples together and chose 12 of them. Now, more important than sleep, Jesus prayed. When he had a big decision, choosing the 12, he prayed. And there's more. In Mark six forty five, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Now, a little context, this is right after he fed the 5,000. So right after... A good day. Well, instead of celebrating with his friends, what did he go do? He went to pray. And Mark 14, 32, 41. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed, and if possible, the, and if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So, again, more important than sleep. And when you're getting ready for one of the biggest times of his life, his death, what did he do? He prayed. Now, from just them few, I mean, I can see that praying is important to Jesus. But, you know... He was the son of God. You know, he didn't live in our time. You know, he didn't live in our type of society. I mean, we have, you know, work and school and church and events. 
you know, we have to deal with family and friends and maintain all of our stuff, you know, we're just way too busy to make prayer a significant part of our life. I mean, one prayer for me won't make much of a difference. Why worry about it? Well, turn into James 4.2. You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. So if you want it, ask. Flip back to Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. So if you want it, ask. I mean, God will not force his assistance on us, but he will wait for us. I mean, he insists that we ask because he wants us to learn to depend on him and to give him the credit for intervening in our lives. I mean, did you see that last song Henry had there? You know, fall down on my knees so I can get out of the way so you can see God, not me. That's why God asks you to pray you know to God be the glory you know remember prayer is meant to be a conversation where your life and your God meet you know not just when there's an illness or you know in a public setting that demands it I mean you know when so when you get so busy don't cut short your prayers I mean, and don't get so busy that you don't hear and see God's side of the conversation. I mean, it is a conversation we're having in prayer. You know, Martin Luther said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Did you hear that? I'm so busy, I'm going to pray more. It's important. It will make a difference. Now, we heard from the experts. How about just hearing from about a, a common family to see if prayer does make a difference? In the early uh, 1890s, a girl was born, and she grew up into a young lady full of faith. And she met a young man, and they decided to get married. Well, they left to go to South Carolina to meet his parents. When they arrived there, both his parents were on their deathbeds with typhoid fever. And this family knew not Christ. So she went in and prayed for them. Miraculously, they were healed. On seeing these events, all 42 members of that family became believers and were baptized. One prayer made a difference. But it didn't stop there. In 1960, a boy was born to a woman of this same family, but he was nine to 10 weeks premature. He was extremely ill. I mean, you could hold him in the palm of your hand. And in 1960, you know, prenatal care and all was not what it is today. Uh, I think they gave him a 2.5% chance of living. So the doctors said there was no hope. They said even if he survived, he would be so disabled. And his mother said, no, 
He will be fine. He will survive. So she called in her family, and they prayed. In three months, that baby boy left the hospital fine. But it doesn't stop there. As that boy grew, made good grades, played sports, no disabilities, no anything. But when he was in the sixth grade, he ran into another challenge. Within a couple hours, he went from feeling great to having 105 temperature and falling unconscious. Diagnosed with spinal meningitis, caused by one of the seven blood transfusions he had as a baby. Doctor said, you know, three days unconscious with 105 temperature, he's gonna be seriously brain damaged. There's only four people in the world right now that have survived spinal meningitis. He's not, you need to call your family in and say your goodbyes. His mother said, no, he'll be fine. So she called in her family and prayed. In three weeks, that boy left the hospital fine, no brain damage. Now you'd think, <laughs> shoot, that boy's gonna be something great. I mean, with that start in life, he's probably gonna do great things for God. But, you know, like many of us, life stepped in. You know, he, he knew of God. He didn't walk with God. You know, as he grew, he got involved with alcohol, drugs, sex. You know, but as he also knew, God was there. So when things bottomed out terribly... When he turned, God was still there waiting on him. All he had to do was ask. So this boy still continued to grow, and when he turned into about uh, 30, he met a young woman and decided to get married. Now, in their premarital counseling sessions, uh, the preacher asked him, Have you been baptized? He said, no, sir. And he, you know, he knew God. He's never baptized because he knew the way he lived. He didn't deserve to be a Christian. He wasn't worthy. But the minister asked him to think about something. How are you going to commit to this woman to be your wife if you've never committed to God? So the man thought about this, and he prayed. So although his journey with God had begun before birth, his obedience to God did not start until he was 31 years of age when he was baptized and started walking with God. Now you're probably thinking, well, okay, he probably did good after that. Well, no, that's why they call it a journey. I even call it a cross-country race. It's, it's slow. It's got its ups and downs. You know, it's, it's been a very slow process, but in 1994, he gave up the alcohol. He stopped doing all the drugs except for marijuana in 1995. You know, but he had started working in the church, reading his Bible more, taking God with him to, to work and to play, but it took until 2010 before he gave up marijuana. But he's still working on becoming a godly man. Now, if you were to ask him, he'd tell you, if you think you're not hurting someone by your lifestyle, you are. If you think you're doing your best, you're not. You say, I can't. You can He would also tell you, you are exactly where your decisions have brought you. You can blame it on whoever you want to blame it on, but I guarantee you is one thing. Your decisions took you there, and your decisions will take you wherever you're going to go. I mean, I stand in front of God one day, and I have to explain why I didn't follow his path. You know, he had a plan, and I had a plan. And I've got to tell him why I took my plan. 
You know, and I don't want to see that or see anyone else have to do that. I want to see everyone thrive. So, you know, if you need help, ask. You know, ask some of us that have been there. You know, ask me, ask Henry, ask, you know, we've been there. We'll be, we're more than willing to help if we can. But just remember this, that a young girl prayed for two people. And because of that, over 100 years later, a man stands before you, still on a journey. So I want to challenge you to make a difference. Pray. I want you to do a couple of things for me to help out. Reach you some sticky notes. Put one up there on your mirror. Put one in your car. Put one at work, on the desk. Just put, I need to pray. Because the more you're reminded of it, the more you'll do it. And another thing I'd like to do is, is do a prayer journal. You know, take a, a regular notepad, notebook. On one side of it, write your prayers. And on the other point, write God's answer. That way you can go back, see what you've asked, and see the other side of the conversation. And it will help you, you know, every couple of weeks to turn back and go, oh, you know what, I'd probably need to call him and ask how he's doing. I've, I was, I've been praying for him. You know, keep in touch. I mean, prayer is a powerful thing. I mean, it's, I put worship and prayer together as, a, as, a, as real powerful difference makers. But they've got to have your focus on them. I mean, you've got to focus. When you pray, if you let the world come in, you're, you're not going to pray. You're going to start thinking about what's going on to work, what's doing this. Same way with worship. You know, once, we, once we're up here you know, playing and singing, leading worship. If you don't focus on God, if you're look, thinking about the music or you're seeing that or you're watching your buddy over here or this guy over here sing or watching who's coming in the back door, you know, it's, it's like driving. If you focus on the windshield instead of the traffic, you're going to have a problem, aren't you? The same way with prayers and, the, and worship. If you don't focus on God, you're not going to be doing it. So let's put our focus where it needs to be, on God, and pray. Now there's a, uh, one other thing that has to, uh, when, you know, because we talked about worship, we talked about prayer, and both of these fall into the obedience of God, you know, following him when I, you know, when I changed and started walking with God or try being obedient to God. Um, there's other things that he asked us to do, and one of them is communion, which we're going to have in just a, a little bit. Um, and he asked us to do this for, for a reason. It's, well, let's just read about it first, and then we'll... So if you go into 1 Corinthians uh, 12, let's see, what is it, eleven twenty three? For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he was giving thanks, he broke it and said... This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. 
A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. It's an obedience thing. We do these things to remember what God has done for us. And we have to do these things the right way. You know, it's like the focus in worship. Worship the Lord. Let everything else be out of your sight. When we pray, we pray for our daily needs, not just our wants. We, 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 we should want what God wants, so he doesn't need to know what we want. We want what he wants. He does want to know our needs, you know, so he knows he's providing for you, and you know he's providing. He already knows. And then communion. You do it correctly. You do it because you're remembering what he gave up for us. You know, in that right now, why don't we go ahead and pray and take communion right here. Our gracious Heavenly Father, what you give us, what you've done for us, and what you will do for us, we give you thanks. We pray with thanksgiving. We pray for the people here that they will examine themselves and see God. We ask that you bless all of us as we know you do every day. We ask that you provide tomorrow's food today in abundance, overflowing, because we know you can. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.